All right, g'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. And in today's video, we are gonna be doing a bit of a part two to a video that I've already done earlier on the channel, taking a look at some AFL season reviews. Now you may or may not have caught it already, but I've already done 10 season reviews for the 10 teams that missed the finals not too long ago on this channel. So in today's video, we're gonna simply look at the eight teams that did make the finals from eighth to first. I would have done this video earlier, but you know, trade period came up and all the drama surrounding that kind of overtook. So I thought today's a good opportunity to get back to the season review stuff. So without further ado, I'm going to get started firstly with the Western Bulldogs. It was yet another inconsistent year for the Doggies, obviously overcoming a slowish start to finish the year strongly and play back-to-back -back finals. However, just like last year, despite making the finals, they exited in week one in what? in theory was probably a very winnable game for them. Since their 2016 flag, there's no doubt they've really regenerated the youth through the list, but it was good to see them get back to some of their trademark footy, in particular their handball happy game style. They had some previous stars of the club return to that form, in particular someone like Caleb Daniel earning another All-Australian Guernsey for his performance out of the back half. They unearthed Mitch Wallace as a leading goal scorer of the club, which is not something people would have predicted, and Tom Libertoria also had a return to form. We know that they're a midfield strong team and their ball movement in particular was a feature this year, but what they do still lack is that goal scoring power. Outside of Mitch Wallace playing a great season, obviously the new recruit Josh Bruce didn't really fire, and also Aaron Norton didn't quite have the consistent year maybe its fans were hoping for. Now obviously we know that they were recruiting Jamara Ugal Hagen with likely pick one in this year's draft, but obviously he's going to need time and support to develop into the player they're hoping he will be. They've been talked about as having a very productive offseason, and that's very fair, but I do wonder if they missed an opportunity to add to the list in terms of their goal scoring capacity. In terms of a high point of the season, it's a little bit lame to say their 10 goal win over the Wooden Spooners, but I did think Aaron Norton booting six in that game and showing signs of the future, that was probably a win that will live long in the memory of Dogs fans. In terms of a low point, they'll look back on their big loss to the Blues by nine goals earlier in the year as a bit of a head scratcher. To make finals and not win one is exactly what they did last year, and in terms of a letter grade, I'm gonna give them a C for this season. In terms of the future outlook, things are looking pretty good for the Dogs. I did just comment on their lack of goals scoring power right now, but they're going to unearth some players like Aaron Norton's going to continue to develop and Jamara Ugal Hagen will come in and bolster that. So in addition to all the young talent they have, I think they've got a very good young list. They've got one of the deepest midfields in the league with adding Adam Trelaw and obviously Stefan Martin comes in to help out Tim English in the ruck and there's plenty of reason to be excited for next year. Next up is the team that also went out in week one of the finals, my beloved West Coast Eagles. Now the premiers from just two years ago did have a textbook up and down year. Obviously they started the year poorly with that first Queensland hub, went undefeated in Perth and then came back to Queensland and battled through injury and some little bit of lack of form and eventually went 12 and 5 to finish 5th. It was a much better showing in the second hub and that middle period in Perth they showed some really good form with good wins over Geelong and Collingwood but ultimately they weren't good enough to crack the top 4 for a second year in a row. Now, yes, they did go out in week one of the finals. I don't know if I really hold that against them too strongly because that Collingwood game was one of the better games we saw from any team this season. It looked like two top four teams going head to head. Now, a week one exit reflects poorly on a side that actually went 12 and five this year, which is a very good record. But that being said, it has to be acknowledged the Eagles were a fair way off the flag pace. The midfield struggled to perform despite having so many good players in there, including the addition of Tim Kelly, and their once deadly ball movement was probably a little bit too slow to really trouble teams. High point of the season was probably beating Geelong in Perth in what was a finals-like atmosphere, and the low point was almost certainly their round two loss against the Gold Coast in the COVID comeback game. Given how much they invested in someone like Tim Kelly to improve their list now for a premiership tilt, you have to mark them harshly, and I'm going to give the Eagles a D for this season. I've done a video on the Eagles and where they're at already. I don't think it's panic stations, but in terms of where they are, on the premiership clock this season is a swing and a miss. I'm not going to buy into the predictions that they're going to drop down the ladder. I think they'll be thereabouts again next year, probably around the mark of being an outside chance for the premiership. Next up, we've got one of the most talked about teams right now, the Collingwood Footy Club. Now, after a grand final appearance and a prelim exit in the last couple of years, there's no reason to think that Collingwood weren't gunning for a premiership this year. And in round one, they looked on premiership pace. They absolutely tore apart the Bulldogs. They were a little bit sloppy on the restart and they weren't the only team to be sloppy after that COVID comeback. 
But midway through the season, they were talked about as one of the best defensive teams in the league with their win over Geelong in Perth. Unfortunately, that was followed by two bad losses to the Eagles and Fremantle, and things started to kind of tumble after that. They were hit by both injuries and fixture congestion when all the teams obviously moved to Queensland, and they never really got their season back on track after that. The back line was undoubtedly a positive and a strength for the Pies this year, with Darcy Moore, Jack Crisp, and Braden Maynard all putting in elite seasons. But like the Bulldogs, scoring power wasn't issue with only Brody Majacek scoring more than 14 goals this season, I believe. The high point has to be said, their huge win over the Eagles in Perth by one point. I could see how much that meant to the fans, and in a year that didn't have a lot of highlights for them, that will be a great memory. But to follow that up, they probably had their low point of the season, their semi-final exit against the Cats, where the final score probably flattered them to some extent. In the same way, I judged the Eagles to finish where they did, leaving in week two. With the squad that they have, I'm going to give the Pies a D as well. They did win a final, which was a great result considering the season they had with a lot of adversity. But ultimately, again, like the Eagles, this is a team that should be competing for a flag. In terms of list talent, I think Collingwood is good enough to go again next year and compete for a flag. That being said, it remains to be seen what the fallout will be from this awful offseason. They've turfed a number of best 22 players, including Adam Trelaw, and it remains to be seen what effect this PR shitstorm will have on the club on field. For now, I'm prepared to go as far as to say that the Pies will be in the finals mix for next year. Next up, we got the Saints, and it has to be said, for a team that hasn't made finals in nine years to actually go all the way and win one, this season would be a resounding success for them. Obviously, this was Brett Ratton's first full season in charge as head coach, and on the back of a bumper trade period where they added five best 22 players last year, excitement was definitely in the air this year. Aided by some better injury luck this year, the development of young players, and of course, the impact of the new recruits, it looked like a complete completely different St Kilda footy club this season. In particular, Dougal Howard, Zach Jones and Dan Butler all performed well out of the new recruits and had pretty high finishes in the best and fairest. On top of that, Jack Steele continued his development and had an absolute breakout year, winning both the best and fairest and his first All-Australian Guernsey. The much talked about Ryder and Marshall combo also worked well in the second half of the season, despite people thinking it was a little bit odd that they recruited Ryder when they had Marshall. On top of that, Max King has joined the club and in his first full season of footy, you can see the potential this kid has. They're an incredibly young side, one of the youngest teams in the league, and they certainly probably bottled a couple of games that were winnable, but overall, this season was a massive success. The high point for me was when they convincingly beat Port in Adelaide. Port only lost three games throughout the home and away season, and they kicked one behind and absolutely steamrolled them. On the flip side of that, their low point was probably that loss to the Eagles, where the Eagles basically had all the injuries in the world and still managed to knock them off. I thought that was a bit of a missed opportunity for the Saints there. As I said, to go from not playing finals for nine years and then winning one, that's an absolute A-plus for me. And in terms of next year and their general outlook, because of how young they are and how much upside they have, there's no real reason they won't be around the market again. They've added Brad Crouch and Jack Higgins, so they've strengthened the best 22 to 25 as well, which is something that they need to look at. I'm confident they will play finals again in 2021. I'm not sure as far I'd go as far as to say top four yet though. Next up, we'll have a look at the Brisbane Lions who after a top two finish last year, managed to back it up and do it all again this year. They've proven last year wasn't a flash in the pan and by pretty much every metric had a very successful season, although I do wonder if this season is a bit of a missed opportunity for them. It's certainly not a criticism because they were outstanding this year and probably did play to their full potential, but you have to think without having traveled too much this year, the grand final was going to be at the Gabba should they have made it. It does seem like an absolute golden opportunity went begging. But they were unlucky to some extent. They had a 17 round season, of course, and went 14 and three, which is an incredible record and were unlucky not to finish top of the ladder. Despite being an already young team that's contending, they managed to add six debutants this season and unearthed some really good young players. Brandon Starsevich and Calamar Chi in particular, along with someone like Zach Bailey, continue to prove their potential. We all know about Lockie Neal, of course, who took his game to the next level and was a far away Brownlow medal winner. They probably also improved their forward line dynamic with less reliance on Charlie Cameron, and I believe they had seven players kick more than 10 goals this year. There really aren't too many negatives to draw out of this season, but I guess if you had to pick one, it'd be the Lions goal kicking, which certainly cost them in some big games against Geelong and Richmond in particular. In terms of a high point, nothing could really top their week one finals win over the Tigers, which broke something like a 15 year hoodoo. For me, that was one psychological hurdle they needed to get over, beating someone like Richmond in a big final. For them, that is something huge they can take into next year. In terms of a low point, they only lost three games in the home and away season, so it's hard to pick one, but I'd say probably round one where they lost by five goals to the Hawks is the MCG, which was an absolute lifetime ago. That probably doesn't reflect well on them for a team that was actually much better than that score suggests. 
In terms of a letter grade, you got to give the Lions an A for this season. Despite it being a missed opportunity, they at least won a final and broke a hoodoo against another major contender. In terms of an outlook for this team and future seasons, there's few teams you could make an argument have a better young list than the Lions with so many young players with upside like your Berries, your McCluggage, Cam Rayner, Harris Andrews. These guys are only going to get better. On top of that, someone like a Lockie Neal, Charlie Cameron, these guys are still in the absolute prime of their career. So long story short, the Lions aren't going anywhere. For me, they're one of the flag favorites for next year, and it's just a case of getting some wins at the MCG to take them to that last step. Let's move on to the other preliminary finalists, the Port Adelaide Football Club, and like the Saints, this was a massive success story this year. Many people, including myself, picked finals as being unlikely for them, and therefore it was gonna be the end of Ken Hinckley. But they made some bold predictions of themselves and they absolutely smashed it out of the park winning 14 out of a possible 17 games and finishing with the minor premiership. Now, the potential was always there with Port Adelaide. They've been a Jekyll and Hyde side for a number of years now, but this year was the year they kind of put it all together. We know they had brilliant youth and some really capable senior players, but most of those senior players hadn't really put it together consistently to take them deep into finals for some time. That being said, they put it all together in 2020 and they used to be kind of a slow and sort of inside dominant team and they've completely changed their dynamic, mostly adding it through young players over the last few drafts. In terms of their senior players, you had Charlie Dixon and Tom Jonas bookend and played pretty elite seasons to be honest and in the middle you had Travis Boak and Robbie Gray play almost career best seasons. There really aren't too many negatives you can take out of the Port Adelaide season. Maybe you could point to the fact that they lacked a key back presence for most of the year. And you look at that Dougal Howard trade 12 months ago and think, hmm, that's a bit odd. But I mean, they literally only lost three home and away games this year and led the ladder at the end of every round, if I'm not mistaken. So couldn't really have asked for much more. It really was very unlucky they come up against the juggernaut that is Richmond in the prelim final. And they were very unlucky not to be grand finalists or potentially premiers at the end of the year. The high point, I think, was when they beat Richmond during the home and away season in Adelaide that kind of really cemented themselves as a premiership contender. And the low point was probably the very next week where they took that form to Geelong and got spanked by 10 goals. But look, in terms of a letter grade, you've got to give them an A+. plus. A 14-3 season is incredible. And while they couldn't go all the way when you consider their preseason expectations, they couldn't really have done too much more. It's boring to say that this team, again, also has another positive outlook for the next few years. If you look at the composition of their list, yes, it's a little bit top and bottom heavy. They do rely a fair bit on their senior players, but they also also have some of the better youth in the league that's already playing in their best 22. For Port Adelaide, their worst enemy is probably their own inconsistency. So I wouldn't absolutely bet the house on them being around the mark again next year, but I don't have a strong argument for them not making the top four again in 2021. Next up, we got our runners up, the Geelong Cats. As usual, the Cats were tipped to slide down the ladder in 2020. It's not an unreasonable prediction because if you look at the fact that they finished top last year, made a prelim and then lost one of their best midfielders in Tim Kelly, the arguments for the them dropping down a bit were fairly strong, but if anything, they were the same, if not better, this year. They were pretty much in the conversation for minor premiership all season until sort of a later season fade out meant that they dropped down to fourth. But their brilliant performance in that prelim final against the Lions, which frankly surprised me, set up a grand final against Richmond, which was probably the grand final we deserved to see last year. But plenty went right for the Cats this year. We know that Hawkins pulled out a career best season to win his first common medal. And in the midfield, you had guys like Menegola and Guthrie stand up in the absence of Tim Kelly. They persisted with the Dangerfield forward mid balance again. And while it probably still needs a little bit of tinkering, he was definitely a threat to opposition defenses. They're another side that not a lot went wrong for this year, other than to say maybe their goal kick kicking in the first final and even even in the prelim and the grand final, a lack of goal kicking accuracy probably hurt them. If they'd just been a little bit more damaging with their opportunities in the second quarter of the grand final, it would probably be them with the trophy this year. The high point of their season was probably their dismantling of the Pies in the semi-final, which really gave them their momentum that they took all the way to the grand final. In terms of a low point, again, there's a few to pick from, but probably their late season loss to the Tigers, which might have given up a little bit of a psychological edge to a fellow competitor competitor for the flag. Look, got to give them an A for this season. They broke their prelim hoodoo and went one step further than last year. And that was all on the back of losing Tim Kelly as well. So that's a massive tick. In terms of next year and beyond, I'm definitely not on the train that suggests that they're going to drop down the ladder. They've just recruited Jeremy Cameron, Sean Higgins and Isaac Smith. And I think they're going to be up there again. One thing they might have lacked this year was a second foil to someone like Tom Hawkins, who probably attracted too much attention from defenders. But now they've got the last two common medalists in their forward line. And they that's 
that's arguably the best forward line in the comp. For me, they're my early flag favorite for 2021. Finally, we have got the Richmond Tigers and what more can be said other than the fact that they've elevated themselves to be one of the great teams of any era. 2020 saw them seal their third premiership in four years and the one in between was a minor premiership. Now they did start the year poorly and while many were quick to write them off as being past it, I saw that as a bit of an ominous sign. One thing they love to do is come third and win flags and basically what they do is condition themselves to peak later in the season and it's paid dividends in every year they've won the flag. The one year they didn't win a flag in 2018 was when they started well and went 18 and four and you know pretty much stumbled at the finish line. The great thing about this Richmond Premiership this year was the fact that they had their own fair share of injuries and adversity and players unavailable to play in a hub. But one thing Richmond really do well is elevate some role players to play outstandingly in the absence of others and you had someone like Noah Bolter and Shy Bolton in particular stand up and show how good they're going to be in the future. Then when finals came, Dusty showed that he is probably the best big game player I've ever seen. Frankly, that Norm Smith performance in the grand final against Geelong will live long in the memory for a lot of people, I'm sure. And further than that, Jaden Short also took out their best and fairest in a flag year as well, which will ensure that he is no longer criminally underrated by everyone else. Again, not a lot went wrong for them. Obviously, they didn't adjust well to the hub life. There was a little bit of inner turmoil at the Tigers and, as I said, some unavailability as well. And that all just makes this flag more incredible. In terms of list management, they lose a Jack Higgins and an Oleg Markov and didn't bring any winner in. But that is the cost of being the best team at the top of the ladder. And obviously, there's also some salary cap cuts this year going on as well. In terms of a high point, surprise, surprise, beating Geelong in the grand final. In terms of a low point, that round three loss to Hawthorne at the start of the year does look bizarre in hindsight, but I'm sure they don't really give a shit about that right now. Letter grade, this is the easiest one of the whole list, an A plus because a flag is self-explanatory. In terms of the outlook for next year and beyond, okay, they've got some aging players in Bashar Hooli, Jack Rewalt, and to a lesser extent, Trent Cotchen, but I don't really think that's going to be a problem for them. Frankly, I don't really have a single reason why Richmond might drop off. It might just be a question of hunger and maybe some bad luck. Although to be fair, they did have bad injury luck the last two seasons. It's hard to imagine them not being hungry because if they pull off a three-peat next year, frankly, I think this elevates them as the greatest team of the modern era. Anyway, guys, that's all I've got for the season previews. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you want to see some analysis of the trade period, just look a little bit back on this channel. In particular, we've done a podcast very recently where we go through each of the 18 teams and talk about how they win. If you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe. If you're already subscribed, please stay subscribed and we will see you in the next video. Cheers.